wired into technology transformation. This is the Digital Bulletin Podcast. Hello, listener, and welcome. This is episode 23 of the Digital Bulletin Podcast. It's time once again for us to pick through some of the biggest stories in the world of business tech and bring you insights right from the heart of industry. To that end, your regular panelists, CEO Romley Broad and Content Director James Henderson are here and raring to go. And a little bit later on, we will be joined by Gus Mercado, Design Director for Intuit, to have a live discussion about the bumper case study recently published in our magazine. If design ops is your thing, then be sure to stick around. But first, let's introduce our mainstay guests. Rom, hello. How are you? Hello. Hello. Yes, I'm good. Are you? Are you? Good. I'm I'm good. I'm excited to have um have you both on as usual, obviously, and to speak to Gus <laughs> later. James, you were heavily involved in the Intuit case study. Are you, are you looking forward to today's pod? Yeah, definitely. Uh, um, Gus is one of the four people we spoke to at Intuit. Um, we spoke to one of their partners, Optimal, as well. So we spoke to a lot of people on it. It was it, it's it's been one of my favourite case studies we've, we've done so far. I can honestly say that. So yeah, really looking forward to speaking to him in a little bit. Your job title hasn't officially changed to design ops correspondent yet, but I think that's only a matter of time, isn't it, really? Right. Um, in just a moment, listener, we are going to discuss something else. We're going to put Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse plans for Facebook under the microscope. And then we'll be speaking to Gus after that as well. But before all of that, here is your news roundup. In light of our discussion on the last DB pod about the collapse of Project Jedi, The National Security Agency in the US has awarded a major cloud contract to AWS. It's worth up to $10 billion and Microsoft is contesting it. So here we go again. Elsewhere in the world of big tech, Google has announced plans for a new campus in San Jose, California. Interestingly, it will become one of Google's main sites for hardware development with the internet giant increasingly intent on building its own things. Another big story to cover this month, again on a topic we have discussed before, is a report that suggests the UK could block NVIDIA's controversial acquisition of ARM. This is to do with concerns over national security. That's certainly a story worth following. This month, we've also seen Accenture hit by a significant ransomware attack. Norton LifeLock agree a $8.6 billion deal to acquire rival Avast in the cybersecurity space. And Data IQ raised $400 million to bring enterprise AI to the masses. Now, as usual, you can get access to the best reporting on those stories and many, many more via the bulletin on digitalbulletin.com. But next, we're going to focus on Mark Zuckerberg and his headline grabbing assertion that Facebook will grow into a, quote, metaverse company. Now, I don't think it's any coincidence that Zuckerberg's comments came around the same time as Jeff Bezos was firing himself into space and quite quickly firing himself back down to earth, although I hesitate to use the phrase down to earth where either of these men are concerned. Both got the headlines they were after, but what does Zuckerberg's insights into the direction of Facebook tell us about the power of big tech and how we might interact with each other in the future? Lots to discuss, but first up, what is a metaverse? Now we have the perfect person on the panel to shed some light. Romilly, what's a metaverse? Are you saying I'm a nerd? I think that's what you're saying. Uh, I'm, I'm hinting. I'm not saying, I'm hinting. Have I, or did I read the book that coined the term back in the early 90s when that was a new book? Yes, I did. Yes, yes, I did. And it's, it's a cracking book, if you haven't read it. Snow Crash, um, Neil Stevenson obviously being... A, a very good author, generally speaking, uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Anyway, yeah, Metaverse is um, essentially the idea that we roam virtual and physical worlds at the same time, and that there is a um, a very um, uh, permeable membrane, if you like, between those two things. There's something that we naturally skip between and around, and it's uh, they're both equally relevant to us. And um, yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about what Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg has said most recently is that um, it's going to become a strategic focus for Facebook rather than something that just sort of evolves. And frankly, that's what has been happening for ages. I mean, we we already do this in many ways. Um, and I think Ep- Epic Games uh, boss was talking about this as well, wasn't he, recently, unless I'm making that up. Yeah. Um, and Fortnite, for example, obviously their, their big cash cow is a really good example of how this all works. You... 
Um, my own kid was playing Fortnite this morning, creating things, sharing it with his mates, um, watching Ariana Grande give a concert. Um, you know, these these things are all crossing over um, constantly. He can go to a shop uh, this afternoon and buy Fortnite goodies. Um, we've seen Pokemon and Nintendo get involved. But Pokemon Go, obviously, a massive thing where we're actually taking augmented reality and making physical work, real world experiences like getting overrun run over by buses and things like that you know tangible and real um this has all been happening what i guess it hasn't happened yet is a, a kind of cohesive set of protocols and currencies and things like that where actually the but the, these the metaverse as it were can be kind of um a a, a system that everyone participates in quite naturally um how, well, no. how, how has Facebook been building towards this, do you think? Because you, you mentioned that it's now a strategy. Yeah. It's something that Zuckerberg spoke about formally to very important people to, within Facebook about. What what has Facebook been doing, do you think? Or how, how can we maybe look back at what Facebook has been doing over the last few years to kind of see yeah. this path that they're on now? Yeah, and I, I, you, you would imagine that a lot of what they've done over the last few years kind of had this in mind. And I think that's just been accelerated now by the fact that Facebook is under pressure itself in terms of um, regulatory uh, pressure, where uh, there are sort of noises about breaking Facebook up and things like that. So um, you can understand why they're now, you know, strengthening this message. But if you look at what they were dabbling with in terms of uh, cryptocurrencies a while ago, if you look at all of the investments they've made in VR, and they've made a lot, um, these these are all part of the same picture. Um, but fundamentally, I suppose, what, what they're saying is, look, in order for a metaverse to exist, it has to interact with the real world, the physical world. And Facebook's basically saying, we're going to go and start getting involved in the physical world more. Um, how on earth that presents itself, I've got no idea, but you'd imagine that involves a, a smorgasbord of, uh, of investments in all sorts of different areas that can then, uh, whether it's the entertainment industry, music, um, obviously they're, they're already, they've done a lot around games and things over the years, um, in particular, obviously with VR, but um, I don't know how that, obviously no one really knows how that's going to express itself, but you can imagine them going off and spending a lot of money acquiring companies in unusual spaces for them um, uh, as they stake uh, a, a place in this evolving kind of landscape. But it's going to be um, interesting in the sense that what Facebook's going to try and do, as are other big players, is to um, uh, realise a position of dominance, I suppose, as this kind of evolves. And who is it that ultimately owns the underlying mechanisms that power the whole thing, whether it's currencies or platforms or technologies, or whatever. Facebook wants that to be itself, obviously. Um, TikTok probably would like it to be it, and others are going to be uh, getting involved. And so it's going to be interesting to see now how that evolves over time. But, and this is critical, um, a fundamental uh, underpinning of, of a metaverse concept is that it's decentralized, right? That no one in particular has any level of control over the whole thing um it's a bit like um you know ready player one you've read that of course definitely no 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 but yeah Not. <laughs> it's the, it's since neil stevenson wrote his seminal snow crash a lot of literature and sci-fi has followed the same tropes right the, the, the metaverse is not a uh um, you know you could look at the matrix for example and the, the similar concepts anyway um the if uh, like in Ready Player One, if, if one company seeks to control the whole thing, it breaks, right? That's the whole point. No one participates at that point because no one could, has privacy, no one has control personally of anything. So how does Facebook navigate that? That, you know, that could be an interesting um, um, thing to watch, especially given the criticisms that it already faces at the minute. But yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned TikTok there, and you're right, there, there are going to be other big tech companies who are thinking like this, whether they're making it uh, public strategy as Facebook have done or not. Um, James, do we have to consider the impact of the, of the pandemic here as well and, and how, you know, wh why this is becoming something that's in the public consciousness as Zuckerberg has kind of said about it because the way we kind of communicate and interact together has obviously changed during the last 18 months, hasn't it? And, and this suddenly seems a lot more maybe real than it might have done before that. Yeah, I think it's just another acceleration of a of a trend, isn't it, which might have taken... I don't know how 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 many years, um, which is now on our doorstep. I think that the pandemic has forced people to think in 
in a different way and perceive the world in a, in a different way, which we perhaps wouldn't have considered before. And obviously, you know, the remote working thing and, and, and how we're sort of pivoting to a hybrid model now is is a real example of that. There's absolutely no way that would have happened in this in this time frame, if, if ever, um, unless we were absolutely forced to do it. Um, and I think there's been, I don't know, maybe the, the, I feel like there's been a sort of element of surprise in, in how well that's seemed to have worked. Um, although I think that there's some longer term questions of how sustainable that is. Um, and, and definitely that factor wouldn't have got gone unnoticed by Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and they'll be thinking about how they can build a, a sort of huge presence in this new reality that we're sort of creating, whether that's in work or in the, in the metaverse or, or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it, it, <laughs> it was a bit of it made me slightly uncomfortable where he talked about how people every day would be waking up and jumping into a metaverse. Um, you know, I think that, that technology and social media is already creating some pretty like significant problems for us as a society and certainly young younger people. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know about anyone else. I found I found it a little bit depressing. If I'm honest, I thought it created a pretty grim grim picture of a future. It's very sort of black mirror. But I, I guess that that just shows how much things have changed, right? But you know, so an episode of Black Mirror that showed that maybe five years ago, you would have thought was the the stuff of sci-fi and the you know the stuff of the, the the very very distant future and here we are Zuckerberg talking about them changing from a social media company to a metaverse company in the next five years it's a tiny time frame um, so I do, I do think it's um, it encapsulates you know how how crazy things have changed because of, because of this pandemic I think it's just another example of it yeah well, one thing I really want to drill down into Rom is is the what the experience would be like for a person in in this in this metaverse i mean there because there are a lot of unknowns maybe maybe you can be much better than than i to talk about that but what what would it actually be like for for somebody well i mean if if you read um you know the slightly more fantastical um literature and films and all that that are imagining kind of these crazy vr driven um alternate universes that where we can go and play about in and hack each other and cause crime and, and whatever else is going on in those stories, then that's one idea. I think in reality, though, what we're actually talking about here is an, uh, an interconnected systems, uh, system of different companies, different players uh, doing different things, but ultimately um, all converging on a common space, which is our personal experience of life in a fully connected way. And that's to say, um, Let's imagine a future where our personal data and our, um, you know, our interactions with the online world and the physical world um, are relatively seamlessly combined. And a lot of the experience that we will have if this um, emerges over time, we already have. And we already um, walk around with GPS devices in our pockets which are seamlessly interconnected into Google services or whatever it is. Um, we're already talking to, um, you know, the, the internet in our homes um, and asking them questions that, you know, not that many years ago, you know, you should have known the answers to if you'd actually listened in school and stuff like that. You know, we're already divesting much of our personal time and uh, life on a daily basis to digital um, ecosystems, if you see what I mean. So, um, actually, I, I suspect what we'll see is um, just a, a, a continuing development development of that to make it more and more seamless and usable for everybody. It will happen without us really kind of knowing that it's happening. It's going to be a steady evolution of, of, of technology and, and behavior, ultimately. Yes, a, a development of a lot of the things that we're already doing. And uh, corporate players like Zuckerberg and others... Um, understanding a little bit more about where this is heading and making their plays in that environment. I, th I think that's uh, that's where we are. Now, if you read and listen to what Zuckerberg says about this, it's typically altruistic in terms of the language. We, you know, we want to be a part of building a, a, this a brilliant, wonderful new world where everyone's, you know, companies like us are contrib contributing to building something that's great and all the rest of it. Uh, in reality, what he's saying is, yeah, we'd quite like to own as much of that as we possibly can. And that's what everyone else is saying, too. Uh, it's going to be interesting, though, over the next uh, five, ten years or so to see how this evolves. James, coming to you, 
now do you do you see yourself being absorbed in in this world like is that something that's realistic to you do you think this is a reality i think certainly some sort of version of it will be of course um just in the and i think that you, roman you're right in that it will just ha happen over time and it will feel natural in the same way that the way we communicate with each other now compared to 10 years ago even would have seemed maybe slightly fantastical then and now it just seems like second nature now um and i think that again that's only going to accelerate because you you look at you know younger people the younger generation if you like they've they've known nothing but this um and they are you know intimately comfortable with with spending basically all their lives online rob was talking about his his kid earlier um i've got a couple of nephews of, of a similar age i think um and i saw that when I was reading about the metaverse, Ro Roblox was mentioned, right? Um, and that's where the users create their own online experiences and they communicate with each other. My two nephews are absolutely obsessed with this this stuff. Um, and they would play on it for hours on end if you let them. And of course, it cost their parents an absolute fortune. And that's why it's now valued at 45 billion, which is way in excess of Facebook's gaming arm. So it's obviously seen Fortnite do this and Roblox do this and thought, and seeing where it's going right the sort of convergence um but i think that so it there will be some reality whether it's mark zuckerberg's you know vision of the metaverse i'm not sure but we you know as we're all comfortable with being online but the, the younger generation even, even more so right they live on their game on there, communicate on there. you know it, it, every facet of their life is there um I mean, I think the other question is, I don't, I'm not sure whether we can stop it or it will be stopped, but we should ask each other as a, as a people, whether this is a good thing. Is this something we should be allowing someone like Zuckerberg just to drive through, you know, like no one's, no one, as, as far as I can tell, is asking for this, not this specific thing. He's just come in and said, this is where I see it going. And he's going to go out there and drive it. And he's got the money to make the acquisitions that he wants to, to make it a reality. He's got billions of, of users right there to, to go and do it um i know i sound like a really old man but i just as i said earlier i feel like this is just going to make people's worlds even smaller they, they actually think that it's getting bigger but it's actually getting smaller because you're sitting you know in your bedroom or your front room with a headset on or something like that and people think they're seeing more and more of the world but they're going to see less of it I, and I, as i said earlier i do find it slightly depressing if i'm totally honest i think this there's just to um just to throw in another comment i think it's, it's interesting that obviously we, we tend to find ourselves me in particular referring back to video games as being a kind of it's it, you, you look at what happens in video games and, you, and that gives you a kind of uh an idea of how you might visualize something um, called a metaverse but in reality it's that it, it is useful because what um certainly a younger generation are now used to is going into a video game type experience um these days, and it's very different from, say, our generation when we were playing um, games, which were much more of a passive thing. Somebody made a game and you played it and then it finished and then, right, and then you nagged your parents to go and get the next one, whatever. Um, things like Fortnite and Roblox that you mentioned and Minecraft and so on, what they've done is educate an entire generation of people around the idea that a game isn't something that you just play. It's something that manipulate and change and add to it's a creative space. Um, and uh, by allowing users essentially to be able to control and build their own experiences within the context of that game, they have opened up the door for all sorts of other stuff. Um, and that got, cuts across all of the different you know, games that we've just talked about in terms of how they then go off and form licensing relationships with musicians to give concerts or for anyone else who wants to sell something into the experience of your children can do they can create their own um uh playgrounds for your kids to play now that is that's the context in which all the this metaverse will evolve it's the idea that actually whether you're obtaining information uh, or um you're booking appointments with um doctors or physicians or whatever it is whether you're um, engaging with sports it's going to be an environment in which you have a measure of control and you can kind of customize things yourself there's nothing particularly unusual about that um, for 20 years, people have been writing blogs and becoming publishers themselves. People have been using YouTube to become genuine, actual media celebrities and things like that. So that's that's already there. But what we might have in a metaverse is something where that's kind of that's a bit more organised, and um, you can individuals can locate themselves within there and manipulate the things around them. And there are risks and dangers of 
to that, of course, you know, we're just, just in terms of the pandemic and the vaccines and, and the emergence of vaccine, anti-vaccination as a, not just a fringe thing, but actually a genuine problem these days for reasons that, you know, right thinking people are kind of thinking, well, where on earth is this coming from? It's coming from the metaverse. It's coming from the ability of people to form, to stake a place in the world in a digital sense and protect it and ring fence it and know that there's a community of other people around there that they can share um, opinions with no matter how lopsided and uh, but craft that space for themselves it's about the, you know the user having control over that um, over time um, that will become a risk that needs to be mitigated and understood because culturally this could go in all sorts of weird directions and in fact actually that was what the original book went towards in terms of its discussion of this topic when it coined the term metaverse all sorts of funny things went on so you know I, you know it I, I think that's a, a primary definition of what the metaverse is it's um you know the users having some control and that may or may not be a good thing yeah exactly and that 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 for me is one of the biggest issues is is that you're creating this this world where it actually maybe becomes impossible to to escape from in some ways and we all know we need to escape things sometimes like we, we're it's kind of blurred lines isn't it blurring lines between your personal life and your private life between your work life and home life and and everything between yeah james what do you think about that it's it's, it's very much everything coming it together under one kind of roof isn't it yeah and i think people have um complained about that in terms of the work from home right people are saying actually they're working more hours than ever because there's not this and i'm not talking about our company by the way not you know using this as a platform to complain about our work processes but in in general you know people are saying there's no line anymore you know there's there's no um clear delineation between okay you turn your laptop off walk out of your office get your bus home or drive home and you're home and they're, they're separate places it's definitely this blurring of the line between personal um work leisure there you know there's a convergence of all of them and if we're saying actually we do all of this online all the time you're right it, it, of course of course one's going to bleed into the next and so on and so forth and um, i think it made my opinions on it pretty clear i don't think it's a good thing and i think that's one of the many many reasons for it we 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 i when i when i speak to people for our life and tech feature I always, one of the questions I always always ask, because we're speaking to pretty high profile people in, in technology or technologists, right? Um, so they're consumed by this. And one of the questions I always ask is, how do you switch off from it? And, that you know, a lot of them say, oh, my, my kids, or I, I do, uh, you know, or I paint, or I do this, or I do that. Or if we all do, if all our experiences are all, you know, carried out in the same place, that's going to get harder and harder too. That's not good for people's mental health. That's not good in general for their lives their relationships you know there is still a real world out there where you can walk out your door and, it, and it's real right and we need to protect that brilliant it's a great debate fascinating and we i'm sure we'll revisit this many times in the coming years and, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the notion of a metaverse unfolds for mark zuckerberg and whether he'll achieve his dreams he's a very aspirational guy isn't he so i'm sure he'll then <laughs> certainly have the capital and the enthusiasm to run at it right it's time for us to return back to the universe folks for once um we're gonna say goodbye to rom now bye rom okay Thanks thank for you bye, <laughs> thank you for your input there very valuable and james and i will be joined by gus mercado intuit's design director after this Find us as Digital Bulletin on LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram and at Digi underscore Bulletin on Twitter. For this month's case study review, we're going to look back at our most recent Digital Bulletin cover story on financial software giant Intuit. The article and videos drilled down into the skills and efforts Intuit's design team puts into building hugely popular products like QuickBooks, Mint and TurboTax. And I'm delighted to say that we are now joined by Gus Mercado, Intuit's design director, who was interviewed as part of this project. Gus, how are you doing? Hey, hey, Ben. Hey, James. Uh, I'm doing great. I'm glad to be here and, uh, you know, spend some time talking about Intuit and maybe, you know, the future of design. This is exciting. Fantastic. Um, maybe first, Gus, for the listeners, give um, give a bit of an overview of, of of your role and a very broad overview of what Intuit does as a company. Sure. Yes. Uh, well, Intuit, uh, if you never heard of it, 
Uh, it's it's one of the the tech giants of the Silicon Valley uh, in the U.S. and uh, the organization has over 35 years of history and a lot of really good stuff that has been done um, in the space of supporting small businesses with their finances, um, especially in the area of um, accounting, taxes, and overall money movement. Um, and when we look at the presence that Intuit has globally, uh, the, the leading product uh, that we have around the different geographies. It's called QuickBooks. And this is a financial management uh, software that helps small businesses uh, manage the, the ins and outs of the, you know, any business uh, at, at kind of up to like a mid size type of, of organization. Uh, so we don't necessarily kind of work with enterprise businesses. Uh, so this is more kind of small and mid size, uh, but basically kind of gives uh, is more business that relief and assurance that, you know, all that uh, sometimes is the burden or just uh, the hard work of running a business. We've tried to make that much easier. So businesses, instead of focusing on admin and on the day-to-day -day management of the, the business finances, they can actually save all, all that time, let QuickBooks take care of it, and then focus on what they love the most that is pretty much running their business, expanding their business, spending time with customers and creating value uh, to their customers. Um, now, the role that I play in that uh, amazing mission that we have um, is uh, leading the design organization for our global teams. So the teams that actually sit outside uh, the US. So we have designers across Canada, the United Kingdom, France, Australia, Brazil and Mexico. Uh, that is uh, a little bit of our, our global footprint. Uh, and our teams, the design teams, it's part of a larger product organization. Uh, and we're responsible for creating like the awesome products to our customers. And, you know, there's a lot in that loaded uh, uh, word awesome. Um, but it's our mission to deliver the best to our customers. And uh, on top of that, we are also responsible for uh, the overall visual language for our brands. Brilliant stuff, Gus. Really interesting. And, and as I, I said before, we've developed a, a big case study on on Intuit and, and the design team and, and and the way they approach things. And, and central to that, Gus, is this idea of of or the philosophy of designing for delight. Do you want to talk a bit about what that means? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, when I started at Intuit a little bit over five years now, that was actually one of the main selling points for me to join the organization uh, because it reflected how much they respected not only design as a function, uh, although that is true, but more than that is, is the customer. Uh, when we talk about design for delight, which is Intuit's stake on design thinking, uh, and for everyone that knows a little bit of design thinking, uh, uh, we have the brand of design in the name but the essence of that, when you actually unpack uh, what it is, the methods and the processes that we go through, it's all about putting the customer at the heart of everything that we do. So on Design for Delight, there are actually three pillars in, in our method of doing things that we follow in pretty much every single initiative when we engage in a solution with customers, uh, which are the deep customer empathy phase, so we spend, everything starts with kind of this uh, deep understanding of the customer and we spend as much time as needed with them to ensure that we're not bringing our biases or our own ideas to the table and trying just to kind of make that work. But instead, we understand everything through the lens of the customer and what, what is really important to them. Uh, what are the pains that they are going through? Sometimes we even put ourselves into the shoes of the customers, literally, to understand the pain. And a great example, like my team in Brazil, uh, a couple of uh, months ago, they started a project that we that they call it uh, the, the accountant, which is kind of part of our ecosystem of customers that we serve, but the accountant internship. So we were trying to understand a little bit more about you know, the challenges that accountants were going through. And basically we had some of our product managers and designers spending a week in an accounting firm doing all the jobs that accountants would be doing. 
so they could actually feel at their skin and see on a day-to-day -day basis what are the challenges that actually accountants were going through. Uh, so that is a great example of what we call it uh, deep customer empathy. Now, as soon as we have that deep understanding, we move then to the second pillar that is go broad to go narrow. And in that space, uh, maybe a lot of kind of the stereotype of designers uh, for, for a good portion of the industry, you think the designers are only operating on those kind of, oh, it's all about crazy ideas and coming up with kind of something that no one thought about. Although there is some of that element, but design goes way beyond. But this second pillar is precisely about that, right? It's, it's seeing the problem and coming up with as many different solutions as possible, things that will really delight the customer, will deliver the benefit that they care the most, and then using a very intentional process to narrow it down to some of the key specifics uh, or the key solutions that we believe they are going to be the best one for customers. But then that is not enough. We need to move to the third stage that is what we call the rapid experimentation with customers. And at that point, uh, what we are hoping to do as quickly as possible is to move from our ideas and prototypes into something that we can put in front of customers and we can start testing it out. Because what we know is that the first things that we create, they're not going to work. We already have that assumption. So it's not about validating our ideas, but it's actually seeing what is not working so we can quickly fix it and then we start the cycle again. So those three pillars, they are not necessarily a linear process, but they are more of a cycle where we go through them how many times it takes, it really depends, but we're gonna go, go through that cycle over and over again until we feel that we landed on something that really delivers value to customers. And from that point onwards, then we can move more into the formal part of the development process. Fascinating stuff, Gus. And I'm, I'm always really interested in stories that bring together great process and creativity. And this is really like that, isn't it? James, I'm gonna bring you in here on this as well, because certainly from our perspective, we, you and I have been writing about and covering these kind of topics with a broad brush around digital transformation now for quite a while but in terms of of design that's really seems to have come to the fore in terms of the, the stories and and the and the and the ways we kind of cover it in the last couple of years doesn't it T tell us why this is an area of, of digital transformation that is very interesting and you know maybe sort of put that in the context of intuit as well yeah so i think the, the first one that sort of came to light where we really covered it um specifically rather as you said rather than a sort of broad broad stroke was, was with, with ikea last year um and that was about design teams being sort of inspired and enabled by design ops and being given these tools and toolkits um to really to sort of unblock everything and, and enable them just to get on with design you know doing what they do best which is why you know these these companies whether it's into ikea whoever are uh, investing huge amounts in the best designers they can possibly get. And, you know, the, the market out there is cut through. So people are investing millions of, millions of pounds or dollars. So these processes are about enabling them to sort of get out of the way of these designs and just let them create really great experiences for, the, for their customers um, and ensuring they sort of have a clear direction. And I think we, we've found that we've written a lot about companies having success with the implementing sort of design ops, saying, here's a toolbox go out there and, and and sort of do your best work and about enabling them to do that. So at Intuit, I, I, I specifically, it was about um, design ops really existing to amplify the, the impact of, of the design team. So simplifying those processes, make sure that they're harmonized across those, those you know, geographically split teams that, that Gus was talking about um, and sort of where possible implementing automation as well to, to again, to sort of enable them to get on with that. Um, I think what it was really summed up nicely for me, we, we spoke to um, somebody called Bernice Lee as, as part of this project, um, who's a, a fascinating interview and, and, and a really good part of the project. And she said she looked at the the, the role of des design ops and, and in, in being a sort of mixture of science and art, which really struck a chord to me. I thought it was a really, really nice way of sort of surmising, you know, what the, the impact of design ops was, especially with, within Intuit. Um, and that that sort of reference to art shouldn't be a surprise because I, I found that working with Intuit, it was all tied up with, you know, emotion. It wasn't, sometimes you can maybe think of design as being quite a cold functional thing, but within Intuit, there was definitely, it was wrapped up in, in terms of language, in terms of, you know, emotion and, you know, love and delight and things like that. And I thought that, 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 um, 
description of the mixture of science and art really really summed up nicely you've got the the, the process and the sort of design science there and you've got the art with you know the love and that and, and everything else that, that was sort of tied up in it so that was that was sort of how how what i took away from from it and coming back to you now gus and to pick up on that point james just said why why is it important to go beyond just functionality when when you're doing what you do and and embrace kind of the integrity and emotion i think are the words that you that intuit talks about maybe you can talk about that and share some kind of examples if you if you have any yeah absolutely um you know one of one of the things when we look at relationships between uh, organizations like companies and, and consumers is the factor of trust. And that is probably kind of a hot topic at the moment uh, with everything that is happening uh, with big data, privacy issues. I more and more, this idea of trust is becoming a key factor on the relationship between uh, brands and uh, and customers, and also um, in the overall growth of the business, because if, if they can't build that trust, customers very unlikely will buy from them. Now, why am I saying this? Because design is actually a key component to build that trust. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you look at uh, a specific problem and how we can solve this to the customer, there are many different paths that you can take. There are many different ways that you can deliver that solution, almost like an infinite amount of possibilities. Uh, and making the right decisions, which is another way of saying like designing it with intent and, and really kind of a, a focusing on what is more important for customers and putting their needs over the shareholder needs the organizational needs, but it's really, really obsessing about creating value to customers. They will see that and they will, they will value that and they will start trusting you as a business because of what you are delivering and, and consistently uh, how you've been delivering. Uh, that becomes like a key factor of this. So design translates all these things into actually the experience that customers will um, interact with, right? It's kind of the tangible aspect of the products that we are creating. And we, what we also call um, uh, 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 in, uh, um, really important component of our approach is the integrity part. Uh, and the integrity is the consistency uh, that we have in delivering this is the say do ratio. So if we are actually kind of, we're doing the best for the customers, we must do precisely that. And we should do that over time consistently because that will build that kind of durable uh, component of of the engagement that we have with our customers. Now, we've also talked about emotion. Now, why, why do we actually value emotion? And I think it's important in that point to remember that we are all humans and humans are emotional beings and we connect with things through emotion. Uh, and when we translate that into the specific brand experiences or product experiences or services, uh, that emotional component, when we really integrate that in a, in a strong way, in a meaningful way, that is the thing that creates what we call a delight. Delight, it's a fancy word to say that we are delivering value way beyond customer expectations. All right? So they, they have a specific need or a problem. We can solve that, but we not only solve that problem, but we go beyond we're probably gonna deliver that in a very elegant way, in a very simple way. We're gonna make it so much better than they thought initially that just kind of blows their mind. And I think that everyone that is listening can probably relate to an experience that you had with an organization, with a business, um, and it could be a service or a product that you say, wow, indeed, that was like fantastic. I, I, I'm kind of a, a big tech uh, geek and I know that Apple, uh, it's a synonym of of delight in many ways. And for me, they, they've they mastered that idea of creating experiences that are so similar, so simple, so elegant, that it just creates that sense of awe. You say, wow, this is amazing. But you've, you've asked uh, about an example from Intuit. And because we embrace this, we, we have many, but I would love to call it out one in a specific where we embraced all these elements into something to really help our, our uh, customers in the moments that they need it most. And uh, this, this specific product is called Cash Flow Planner. 
uh, we started this initiative, it was right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so I remember at the time that I spent solid three to four weeks, if not more, just meeting with customers and hearing, I honestly, what at the time was just kind of horror stories of this is specific uh, customer that um, I'm going to call it out here, just as an example, like Lisa, she was kind of a, a yoga instructor and she was kind of contracting and providing kind of yoga classes across many different gyms and organizations. Um, so she had like in-company yoga classes as well. And I remember when I spoke with her, it was two days, literally after they had announced the lockdown. And she said in a matter of 24 hours, all, literally all the contractors, contracts that she had, they have been canceled. So just imagine yourself into that situation as a business owner, where almost like overnight, in her case, literally overnight, your business was striving and the next day you are in a really bad shape. So we heard many of those stories and, and, and it gets really emotional, right? When you really connect with those people, which again, we call it customers, but we put faces in, in those individuals. We connect with them at the personal level. Um, and that was profoundly impactful. And one of the many initiatives that we've adopted at the time uh, was to help businesses to plan better for these moments of uncertainty. What we've realized, and this was kind of already a known product of a problem uh, for us, but it just it amplified with the pandemic, uh, is that the cash flow planning part of the business. So, like, how much in the end of the day, like, how much money do I actually have? Uh, that is the question that they had in mind. Or in the end of the month, how much money do I actually have? And it sounds such a simple question to answer, but it's extremely complicated. There are so many data points that you need to pull in. There's so many projections that you need to do in the future to try to understand what are the different factors that could shape the money movement of my business. Anyway, we took all that and we've created the solution that it's now available globally uh, to our markets. And we launched that very quickly in the middle of the pandemic to help businesses to understand how to plan better for a future that was extremely uncertain. And this is kind of one of the, the top features that we have in the product uh, nowadays. Um, and I love this story because it really connects to everything that we've been talking about, right? Uh, of our process, but mostly to what we really value the most that is making the lives of our customers much, much better. And James, look, customer obsession, customer centricity is something we hear pretty much from everyone we speak to. But this seems to be a, a, a real example of where that kind of customer obsession is driving the product design and driving into it forward and, and, and ultimately serving its customers in the best possible way. Yeah, absolutely right. I think when you hear sometimes we do hear it from everyone and, and there is sometimes that you feel like companies sort of have to say, right, we, you know, we are obsessed with, com you know, customer service and, and, and our clients. Um, and of course, some de most, most definitely are, of course. Um, but, and, and with sort of design for delight, when you first hear it, right, there might be this sort of temptation to think that's just marketing speak or that's, you know, that's, that's something that some, someone's coined, some external agency has coined. Uh, but so I think once you, once you start to, to speak to them you see that actually that is a principle that, that sits right at the heart of the, the design team um and uh, as Gus sort of went over that it you, you, it's not it's not just marketing talk because it starts sitting down with a customer for as long as it takes to understand their needs um not just saying right we're going to pull this off the shelf we, we think this will do for you maybe we might tailor it a bit and it's not it's not about that it's about really understanding their pain points and you know what what is it that they need and really understanding them and you know bringing them into your business and sort of embracing their thinking you know putting yourself in their shoes like i think you actually said that right and then the sort of ideation and building out that that stack of solutions with the sort of rapid experimentation and i think that's where sort of delight comes from that that's it's that's sort of the destination right but you have to work through all of those various bits and pieces before you get there because what you're doing is, is solving a really big issue for someone is actually making their, their their jobs easier or, or or more pleasurable and that's where that that's where that sort of emotion comes in we we all use tech platforms right and we have done 
even more over the last 18 months because we've had to work from home so we've integrated all sorts of, of platforms so we can keep communicating so we can keep abreast of what we're all doing within a business and we know that, that tech can elicit real emotion because when it's not going well for you or when it becomes a, a roadblock in your day the, the emotion is is real and it's bad right you know you, you you end up hitting the table or you know exclaiming or swearing or whatever it may be that's real emotion we know that it can send you into a tailspin some days you just think this day's not for me because my tech's not playing ball my drive is down this doesn't work i can't share documents with this person so the, i guess the opposite of that is when tech just really works and it solves the problem for you and it, and it makes what you want to do easy which is where that sort of the love the delight the integrity comes in so i i I would always be skeptical, right? When a company's like, we put the customer at the heart of what we do. But actually, when you hear about the processes and you know how it's genuinely part of the philosophy and the heart of uh, what someone does, that's real sort of user centricity in action. I think, and I, th I think that's one of the main things I tried to pull from from the interviews was everyone sort of understands that and embraces it. And I think that uh, you said, Gus, that it's one of the first things that people do is they take a course on what you know, design for delight actually means. That's how important it is. It's one of the first things. If you join into it, doesn't matter what department you're in, bang, you understand that. You know, it's part of how you work every day. So, yeah, that was that was definitely one of the main themes that, that I tried to pull out of it, and that definitely came across from the from the interviews I did with the guys at Intuit. Yeah, can I just adding a point here? I love what you were saying, James. Um, on a personal note, just kind of abstracting a little bit this discussion from from Intuit, but. I, I honestly believe that this, what we call a customer centricity or at Intuit, we might call it customer obsession or design thinking, design for life. They're all trying to describe the same thing, which is we should all be serving the customer first. And I think that maybe at, at some point in history, in the, in the capitalism history, we've kind of lost track of that. Um, but if you want to make this world a better place, uh, organizations, they play a critical role in doing this, but we need to remember that we are here to serve others. That is a much more meaningful um, purpose to live our lives and actually to be part of organizations. And the more organizations embrace that, more they are going to benefit the world. And consequently, they will benefit their businesses as well. Because look, there's no magic here. When you do the best for your customers, they will come back. They will buy more from you. And your business is going to thrive. It's that simple. But I think sometimes we put our own interests ahead of, you know, what we should be doing that is serving customers first. And that's where probably like things go in the wrong direction. Okay, Gus, brilliant stuff. There are a couple of other points I want to pick up on. We've spoken a lot about customers. We've spoken a lot about process. Let's talk about your own people, the designers. Mm. I think you called them superhumans. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this is awesome. You know, um, when I think about this question, uh, I can't avoid but think about um, a documentary. Actually, one of my favorite documentaries of all time. It's called Free Solo. If you if you're listening to this and you didn't watch it, uh, just go online and find it. Uh, it tells the story of uh, a climber, an American climber called Alex Honnold. Uh, and basically he was on this quest to climb El Captain, that is one of the tallest uh, um, uh, walls in the Yosemite Park, the national park in the US, with any ropes. That, that's kind of the idea of free solo. Anyway, why am I saying this? Because uh, the idea of superhumans, it's normally when you see situations like this one that I'm describing with Alex, and it's like, how did you do this? I had no idea that we can actually achieve something like that. And this actually has kind of a twofold uh, consequence. Number one, you start looking at that and you get inspired and say, you know what? Someone did it. So maybe I can become a better version of myself and kind of achieve that as well, which I think it's awesome. It kind of helps us to progress and evolve as humans. But on the other side, it also creates just kind of this, this fascination for others like courage and skill and like the craft, which is, which is amazing. Now, when I use the word superhumans to describe designers, uh, in many ways, uh, like designers as just pretty much all the other functions, we have that uniqueness, right? That like when you show up and you demonstrate your, your superpower, 
uh, you just get the people around you and say like, wow, this is incredible. And, and in many ways, every time that I engage with the designers in our team, that's how I feel. Uh, we are kind of in design reviews or in ideation sessions or just kind of trying to solve really complex problems. And it blows my mind to see what they come up with. Uh, and sometimes you are just talking in abstract level and then suddenly someone just say, hey, like, I've got a prototype here. Check this out. Is this kind of what you're all talking about? Or like, I have a different spin with all the inputs that you're providing. We can go in that direction. Here it is. And we can all see that from the same angle. So that that is kind of one of the many facets of designers that I would characterize as kind of superhumans. Really on a final point, bringing, bringing together everything that we've spoken about and, and looking ahead and looking at your industry going forward with, with you right at the center of it, obviously, how, how, where do you see the industry heading? What are the, what are the big trends sort of upcoming in the, in the design space, do you think? Yeah. You know, what we've been through in the last 12 to 18 months, they've accelerated many of the trends that we had anticipated maybe for five to 10 years in the future. And they're happening now. So I'm going to call it out just kind of a couple of them. Um, so the first of all is we're seeing much more the governments getting closer to big tech. So regulation, it's coming left, right, top and bottom. And they're, they're here to stay and to kind of provide more guidance and control on what like, all the big organizations, the tech organizations they have been doing. So a couple of things like around data privacy, that's a big topic. Open banking, for those who don't know, there's quite a lot of regulation about just being able to have like a free flow of financial data within the, the organization, uh, within the, the, the specific geography. And that is something that is being regulated by governments. Uh, taxes, digital currency, another like really hot topic. And we can spend a whole podcast just talking about each of these. So I'm just kind of going to give you the helicopter view and maybe on another sign, we can talk a little bit more about them. The second um, big trend is that due to those regulations, what is happening is just the entry uh, level for these markets are just being lowered by, by the government. So that is going to provide a huge rise of tech startups that are challenging the big established businesses. And a great example of this, it's what is happening in the UK with the neobank, like Monzo or others. Uh, so you, if you think about it, that space was purely dominated by the large like financial institutions. And now we have just a wave of really modern and great organizations that are creating a service and a, and a product that is phenomenal and much better than many of the established businesses. Now, the third one, it's something that I've actually saw recently on a report that McKenzie uh, published uh, around the massive uh, digitization of, of businesses and experiences. And this is being driven, like accelerated by the pandemic. Uh, this study actually was saying that around 80% of all the business interactions, they were happening online. Just think for a moment on this and how quickly that transformation happened. Now, the amount of opportunity that this will create in the market is endless. I, and it's great for, for Intuit, for sure, because we see those opportunities, but it's also great for the broader market, which will allow many new players to join. And then the final, this is kind of more related to the, the big tech companies. Uh, you're probably seeing already this, uh, is their expansion of uh, their ecosystem of products and services, and that is beyond their core offering. It's very true for us at Intuit. Right? So we are expanding our ecosystem as well, going beyond our original focus of accounting and taxes that is, has been our, our uh, bread and butter for a really long time. And more and more, we are investing in the payments space, in the payroll space, and other fintech services. So those are kind of just kind of some of the, the, the key themes that are, are going on. They're, they're happening and coming our way. Uh, it's really exciting. If anything, uh, we are entering a, a, an era of huge amount of innovation in acceleration for the overall market. Brilliant, Gus. And, and James, any final points to bring it back to the, the Intuit case study? You said you obviously really enjoyed this one and, and, and it was a mm. real um, kind of opportunity to get those, those, those insights that Gus has so kindly shared with us today as well. Yeah, de definitely. It was, it's one of, we've been doing this, we've been cracking on with this for a while now. It's definitely one of, one of my favorites. Uh, 
Uh, and I think, you know, one of the reasons was we spoke to Gus, but we spoke to a couple of his colleagues as well. Bernice was there, Natalie and Joe all from Intuit, giving us a, a real sort of 360 view of the design function and uh, and telling us about it. I think just some of my main takeaways, one is that it, that it is clearly a company that places design at its heart, right? And that goes back to when it was established, I think in the sort of 1980s. And it was when financial products weren't quite what they are now. And it was, it, it was, it was established with an idea for simple and elegant design. I think that's something that's obviously enduring and grown, throughout, you know, throughout the company. Um, and I think that another thing that, that came out to me, we know that um, competition for the best talent in all sorts of markets and, and design is, is no different. is really fierce at the moment, right? Sometimes people can name their price. I think people work best when, when they're appreciated and, and definitely the way that design and design function designers were, were spoken about. If I'm a designer, I find that pretty inspiring, right? And I, I, I think that, that it's no surprise really that Intuit is therefore seen as a sort of a leader when it comes to design, culture and innovation. And the, the last thing that I will say, will say about it is that in a lot of the case studies that we do, they're very keen, understandably, to talk about just their own companies and what they're doing, right? Whereas when I spoke to guys at Intuit, it's almost like a... Um, and I, I, we, we're, we're speaking very emotionally anyway, right? So I'll use emotional language. It was almost like a, a sort of love letter to the, the power um, and the potential of design. You know, I think we, we, I sort of ended it with, with talking a, a quote from, from Natalie Harmon, I think, who said, you know, she sees the role of design in the future as having a real impact on, on, on some of the, the, the big things in the, in, that are going on in the world. So having a seat at the table when it comes to sort of climate change and social justice and sustainability and other societal leaps like that. And I think that that really came across is this is the, the power of design. This is the potential of design. Um, and, you know, what's happened at the moment is incredible, but, you know, the, the, it can go even further, you know, it can definitely skyrocket and be really important to some of the, the big questions and the, and the big, um, the big things that are going on in the world now and in the future as well. Great stuff, James. And I can only echo that. It's a really exciting topic for us to talk about as well. Um, right. That's, that's all we have time for listener. A special thank you to you, Gus, for, for giving up your time to join us. I hope you enjoyed it. Very much. So yeah. Thank you so much for the chat. This was, this was a great opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gus. No problem. And if you want to learn more about design at Intuit, you can read the full feature and watch the videos at digitalbulletin.com. There are, of course, many more things to tickle your fancy over there and on our sister platform, Tech for Good, where last week we published our latest mag, which leads on a brilliant story with Hootsuite and using social media to highlight the quiet heroism of refugees. James, I want to say a big thank you to you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, as always. And we'll be back in a month's time, listener. We'll see you then. That was the Digital Bulletin Podcast. Listen and subscribe to a range of podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. Plug in for news, features and case studies on the very latest in enterprise technology and digital transformation.